Hi guys, welcome to episode 61 of the Grapplers Academy. Um, yeah, bit of a both training back now, full time, like pretty much full time. Yep. In absolute agony today. I was telling uh, telling you before we live in this film, and I was like, last night hit that moment during like a King of the Hill round, uh, feeling sick. Genuinely, I was like trying to grapple near the window in case it came up so I could literally just race <laughs> over and like aim for, aim for out the window. And looked at the time and there was like five or six minutes left out of a 10 minute round and I was like, I cannot feel like this. So I was like, in my head I was telling myself, I was like, all right, if I get taken down, it's not the end of the world. I'll just sort of like not fight up and I'll just like set the pin. And then sort of looked over, next opponent came out and then my pride just sort of went, no, you fucking won't. <laughs> Swallowed it back down. And I just fought through, but I had nothing left. I was kind of like taking 10 seconds to get back up off the mat after I'd pinned somebody. And I was like, and then afterwards I sat there just sort of like in the corner of the mat, just staring at the floor going, what am I doing? <laughs> That was just after the first round as well. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's looking at you like, fucking hell, Sai's let himself go over the wall now, Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, did you have, was it a killer who was coming after you? Or? Do you know what? I can't remember. I just remember the sort of telling myself, no, you fucking won't. Uh, the, the, uh, ego is great, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but it can get you fucked up as well. Oh, 100%. Um, I remember one of the, it, the worst times I've wanted to tap from something that wasn't a submission was uh, the guys on top of me and it's all sweaty we've done like you know an hour and a half of training at this point and the wet t-shirts draped over my face and it's just like being waterboarded um managed to get up from that and then it was straight into re like standing up wrestling and it's just like you know just when all your energy's just been drained and you want to quit and you're like i can't quit because nothing's actually no. happening to me but i just want to there's nothing worse than a soaking wet loose t-shirt and you say you're in bottom mount or whatever and it's just on your face and as you breathe in like you're sort of breathing in sweat as well because it's probably dripping into your mouth it's hard to breathe yeah nah it's the same reason why neon belly is such a good technique yeah it's because you don't really want to tap to it you really don't want to tap to it no and then, but the only thing that you can think about all the time is you can't get the person off with you, especially if it's gay and they put you by the collar and the but belt, you're like, oh, I fucking do not want to be here. And it's like, you look over, it's like a minute into the six minute round, you're kind of like, I'll go enjoy another five minutes of this. Oh, man, my, I mean, this is going to make me sound like a right arsehole, but I <laughs> love Neil <Neon> Belly. <laughs> I've got, I'm, I love her, like, my, my training partner, Mark, makes the funniest noises when you put him in Neil Belly. He'll just straight up start laughing. It's like, are you enjoying this or? I know it's horrible and I know you don't like it, but you're just laughing. His, his default for pain is to laugh. Get it smashed for 20 uh, seconds. Get it smashed for 20 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yeah, I, Neon Belly's probably one of the only things that I could probably smash for more than 20 seconds in as well, to be fair. So. Uh, but there's this one there, uh, you know, plenty of people tap to Neon Belly, don't they? Yeah. Like, it's not uncommon for people to tap to Neon Belly and. You know, I'm only going to think that you're less of a man if you tap to the old belly. No, 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 no judging there. But um, this, uh, we used to have a, a since stopped training, but it's like kind of 15 or 16, really nice kid, big kid, quite strong, um, but really like mentally tough. And you put him on the old belly, like the same the old belly that I tapped somebody out with in the last round. And he's looking up at you and you can tell it's hard and he's like, Come on, is that all you've got? He's like, come on, you pussy. Like, telling me to neon belly your mother. I'm like, oh, respect to mate. And then I just got off in there. I was like, that's, that's the attitude of being shit. You also like, start doubting yourself going, am I doing this wrong? What's going on? <laughs> Normally everyone crumbles. I just took a second to re reposition my knee right in the solar plexus. <laughs> grab the belt and the collar and drive it in for a bit. And he stayed, to be fair, he went, come on, you pussy. I was like, oh, right, okay. slowly puncture his lung. <laughs> yeah, I had a pop in there. Uh, I mean, he wasn't like coughing up blood. <laughs> oh, man, funny. Me on belly, best, best position in Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> yeah, and like, so prior to that, have you ever like, tap to pressure? Have I tapped to pressure? I'm sure I probably have, I don't remember when. I've got. What one. sort of pressure? Like a weird neck crank or. 
Just no, like, like something you won't tap to now, but you've done. Because like, I remember. Just like being stuck under side control or something like that. Yeah, but all that proper gnarly like side control. I'm sure. I'm sure I definitely did when I started off. Yeah. So I know I like. I've got one like vivid memory where. I think it might be my first six months of grappling and I was rolling with somebody, I think it might have been an OG class, and he just had this cross face and it was driving in and I think he might have had about ten kilo on me as well. He had a good I know he had a few years training on me as well. And I he got Joe in and I was like, I could not move. And after about thirty seconds of enjoying it, I was like, I can't do it, and I tapped to it. Then afterwards, I sat there, like, on the side of the mat, going, what have I become? <laughs> <laughs> and every time, you know, like, when it's, like, one of them moments that I flash back to every time that I'm, on, like, under unbearable pressure, where I'm like, no, nah, I'm not tapping, I'm not tapping. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? It, like, puts, it puts it in your head, like, you don't want to feel like that again. Yeah. So you're going to do your fucking damnedest to get out of oh, that position. Because yeah. uh, it feels like shit tapping to something that wasn't a tap, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, Really wish I hadn't tapped then. <laughs> I just carried on. It's like me in that waterboarding moment. I was like, don't tap, don't tap. I have no respect. It's like, like imagine now you, you know, you got your black belt and uh, some big, enormous white belt comes in. It's like the first couple of sessions and they're just enormous and huge. And he just gets you in a uh, cross side and he's putting that pressure on your face and you tap. It's not going to be our damn well, is it? I'd be like, under my belt, this is now yours. But also, you're thinking, like, well, fucking hell, I've trained like 10 years here. I'm big, I've competed, and I'm getting fucking smashed. And I want to quit because somebody's basically just driving the shoulder into my face. Yeah. There, there is an argument to just being big and heavy. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Brockmaster that's approach how, to grappling. That's how I've got through these <laughs> the past 12 years of grappling. Well, this is going to be a brilliant segue to what we were going to talk about before as well. Like, any jiu-jitsu, as, as well as being a massive and being strong and, and being a, is a big advantage, like... Any body type can do jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some areas where you think it's going to be a massive advantage to be one particular body type actually is a massive disadvantage when you get put in a slightly different scenario. We were mm. talking about people with long legs before, weren't we? Yeah. Uh, when we were recording before. And, um, you know, like we were talking about the leg lace. And leg lace can be really difficult to get around somebody who's got really long legs, especially if they're like six foot seven. I mentioned in no names. You've basically got to walk off the mat to walk around the legs and come back on. Uh, <laughs> Leave the building. Yeah. <laughs> Coming through the fire uh, exit. And hope hope that they're too slow to be able to turn around by the time you come back around. Uh, but, you know, even though it's as much of an advantage for stopping you getting past the guard, um, if, like you said, you get into that body lock position, it's going to be really tough for you to re-guard because your yeah. legs have got to go so far and they're so big to get in. Yeah. You ain't getting butterfly hooks back in and, and oh, re-guarding is going to be tough. And sometimes as well, like because the levers are that long, when you like say in butterfly, when you do get the heels into the hips, that extension power is by going to be next to none because of how long the lever actually is. Whereas, if you're like myself with very short levers, little hobbit legs and arms, it's kind of easier to get round my legs, but it's very easy for me to recover them back through because I've just got shorter things to get everything in. I think uh, Lord of the Rings might be the perfect metaphor for Jiu Jitsu, isn't it? There's always a golem on the mat as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the elusive one ring is the black belt. It's, it's kind of like a perfect metaphor, isn't it? Because you, like you said before, I can't remember who you said, said it to you, but you're either a Gandalf or a, or a Frodo yeah. on the mats. And um, you know, it's true, like, you look at all the weird different character types that there are, in jiu-jitsu rooms, it's like, it is very much like a, one does not simply pass the guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, use the, what's the dwarf guy, is it Gimli? Yeah. There's always a Gimli as well. I feel personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel personally attacked. <laughs> and, uh, like, I'd say, like, Gimli's the one that's sort of, like, always ready for those brutal rounds. Um... Is it Aragon the elf one or is that? Uh, Aragon's like the main uh, human guy, isn't he? Yeah. The elf. That's the, the sort of like. One. He's the guard. Leg, 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 yeah. guard pulling a leg lock on that's that. That's the isn't he? DVD, like yeah. proper DVD studio, where <laughs> you'll come in with like 
all these new techniques and terminologies and you're kind of like, I've not got a clue what you're saying, but it makes sense and I'm just going to continue doing what I'm doing. And then the, uh, the, the human ones that like, the Matt Hero who will just go with anybody <laughs> and everybody, whether he gets his ass kicked or whether he comes out with about 20 subs, they'll just go with that every person, every does, time. Does that make the, the Wizards then, those like gnarly over 40s blokes that are still on the mats rolling with all 21 year old subs? Oh yeah, just, and the ones that'll go, yeah, some a little flow roll. And then they'll get to an advantage position and just go to like full <laughs> tail. <laughs> yeah, actually, do you know what? Everybody over 40 that I've rolled it does that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just don't tap my legs on that thing and then straight onto like a leg lock straight away. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah. I've got a bad shot, I want to stay away from it. <laughs> Rolling. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> It's like, um, uh, back, <laughs> back to that though, it's like you've ever been uh, guillotined off somebody who's like really small and skinny. Usually girls who've got like arms like a fucking crowbar. You basically just bone. Mm. It's like getting crowbar, like choked by an actual piece of metal. Yeah. And it's always really easy for them to get those underhooks as well, isn't it? I think I'd much rather get rear naked choked with somebody with big arms than guillotined with somebody with little a little crowbar wrist. It... But with the guillotine, it's usually straight onto the neck, so it's a quick attack. Whereas somebody with big like arms in the back, bad, it? <laughs> if they can't get under the neck, mm, they're going to go across the face and under the jaw and Christ you're going to end up with your jaw over this side, your nose up and where your eye is, and then your eyebrows down on the bottom of your chin. I mean, it's technically a tap, isn't it? It depends on which technique was there, but I think that, that's how Nicky Rod seems to win most of his matches. So. Oh, did you see the poster that the B-team put with Nicky Rod? Where it's like advertising their open map and it's Nicky Rod on the back of Muhammad Ali. <laughs> I'm not like this. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's good. Actually, just reminded me. Actually, what do you think of their policy for their memberships or for their sort of like? I've not seen it. So you've got to be purple belt or above, um, and you have to apply. I think that I don't know if that's for the pro sessions or for the general memberships, but you have to apply to be on there and then kind of like be vetted to come on. If it's for. The pro sessions, um, I could I could see that that's not, I'm not going to say a bad not a bad thing, but um, I can see why they're doing it. Yeah, because they want training partners. That I think they do this at, at uh, Henzo's anyway, don't mm. they? Because the people who I've heard who have been over to Henzo's, you like if you want to roll with the main guys, you have kind of got to prove that you're a, a active competitor currently yeah. already. Um, and kind of prove that you're not just going to go in and spaz out and try and hurt somebody. So with, with them being as active as they are um, and, the, and the skill level that they're at, I, I don't say that that's necessarily a bad thing for the uh, for like a pro class or a, or a comp class or whatever, if you want to train with the main guys. But if it's just for open membership for new people, I don't know, just, you can't shun beginners. No. But maybe like they know their coaching quality isn't suited for beginners. I was thinking that as I was thinking through that process. Then yeah, maybe they, maybe that's more of a reflection on them. Like you are not really suitable for coaching beginners, so we just want to coach people already with a existing knowledge base. Yeah, like you're gonna to come to us with an existing game, and we're gonna make that game better and expand it, mm. as opposed to we don't want to be teaching complete beginners how to navigate around grappling but the other argument would be then that if you get somebody with no bad habits and then show them immediately from the beginning how you want them to play jiu-jitsu yeah, then right. you're going to form them to an even better player even quicker mm. like Nicky Rod's only just a purple belt yeah yeah no I see that I don't know, I wouldn't really say it's a purple belt now. Wait, well, he is though, isn't he? Yeah, I think, but well, that's more when he, when he, surf, when he started he training there, uh, he's not a purple belt, is he? And no. He's as valuable as, as a training partner there, from what you can tell. Is anybody else on the mats who's black belts, brown belts, whatever? I think they have, um, like, as well as being purple belt and above, there's also sort of exceptions to the rule where if you're like a high level wrestler mm. or if you're a pro MMA fighter as well. Yeah. I kind of it's their school they can do whatever they want yeah because I, could, I do kind of get it because then they sort of yeah they're going to be take probably people are going to travel to train there and leave their existing clubs but 
I don't think I think they know where their specialty lies. Like I don't know if Danaher will be teaching a fundamentals class or whether he'll be teaching just the, yeah, the season experience guys. I mean, the reality of how I can imagine the situation for that gym is that it's going to be one of those destination gyms that people go to to want to train there. Mm. Um, I mean, they'll have like a, they'll have their member base and they'll have their regular yeah. team training partners. But I imagine there's going to be a lot of people wanting to go and train there just because it's their gym. Yeah. And they want to get some rounds in with them or something like that. So, uh, you know, if you certainly look at it from that point of view, then that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, but it's their gym at the end of the day. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. You know, uh, every club's got its own rules. Whatever. It doesn't matter. No. Go, go somewhere else if you're a beginner. No. It's, yeah. it's not like there's a shortage of jiu-jitsu clubs in America, is it? No. Um, and they're in Texas as well. Yeah, Texas yeah. has got a strong nice. hope for jiu-jitsu as well. Um, yeah, like any, you know, most of the major cities in, G in uh, America have got fucking loads of gyms. Yeah. Because there's like a lot of gyms over here now. Yeah. Um, depending on which area of the country you live in, you, you can open Google Maps and basically see in any little industrial estate that you look up and down the country, there's at least one jiu-jitsu club. Oh, 100%. Like, they do seem to cultivate more in the major cities, don't they? Yeah. Like, I mean, with like the prices of rent and stuff like that, when you're looking at it from a gym owner's point of view, as we both know, uh, the it's cheaper rent for buildings is like further outside of the city centre. Hundred um, percent. There's probably there's probably more gyms in the suburban areas of Greater Manchester than there is slap bang in the centre. Yeah, I have to agree with that actually. Yeah, because again, people are willing to travel. Mm. Like I know I'm willing to travel for training you're the same and like those who love their sport and enjoy their sport are willing to travel a certain degree for what they do it's like football fans are willing to travel hours and hours to go and watch a game so why wouldn't you travel 45 minutes or up to 45 minutes to an hour to participate in training yeah i mean like the reality of it is most people are training around work and this and that so probably the home club is going to be within a five to 10 mile radius of where they live. Yeah. But then those open maps, the weekend training, people travel all around Greater Manchester, they go over to Yorkshire, you know, people will travel like 50, 100 miles to get a weekend training session in if they know yeah. it's going to be a good map. The one at Stealth's, uh, or the, the, the open maps that used to be up at Stealth before lockdown was, was a good testament to that. Because oh, you get people coming from all up and down the country, like Northeast, Scotland, uh, Nottingham, further down. Um, so people will travel for it if they know that the good training is going to be there. Mm. Um, ASW is a really good one. Those yeah. Saturday morning classes are always busy with people from all around different gyms. Yeah. Um, but I think for most people, like especially if you're getting into Jiu Jitsu, unless you're really keen and specific about going to one gym in particular, you're probably going to pick one that's fairly close to where you live. Yeah. For, for realistically. Oh, um, and I think as well if you, as you're doing that. Because like you said, if most people are doing it around work and most people aren't aspiring to be professional athletes, they're going to stick to where sort of like their social circle is as well. So you may have a mate who train and he's like, oh, come down and train with me. And then you're going to go to that. And then as you get more into it, you probably then will travel further out for the open mats. But because you've already established yourself at one gym, you're going to sort of tend to stay loyal yeah. to that gym. Like, um, and it's becoming a more common now where coaches are open to their students visiting other gyms to train. Like it's something I've never had an issue with. Um, Matt doesn't have an issue with it. Um, like if you when when you have your place, I'm guessing you'll be the same. Yeah, I mean, the reality of the situation is you turn up to comps. You probably see the same people in your weight division all the time. Uh, you probably go and train with them at their club or yeah. an open mat that they're going to be at and then you'll meet other people from that gym mm -hmm. they'll go to another place chances are that if you know people in your own uh, your own gym they're going to know people from other gyms as well so you might go with them to an open mat like everybody knows everybody in yeah. it's like it's like one of those weird communities isn't it where because you're not kicking fuck out of each other like boxing or Thai boxing or whatever I think MMA guys do it a little bit but not as much like mm -hmm. there's not as much it, it, cross gym training is there no. um, but like jiu jitsu guys are quite happy to just go and train with whoever basically yeah. 
I can't really think of a lot of people that I know who are active and uh, competitive that are like, no, nah, I'm not sure anybody. I'm sure there are. Yeah, the, I don't know actually. No, I don't say that. I don't think I know of. Or oh. don't know anyone in person anyway that's like that. All the it's like top active guys in the UK are pretty open to training with most yeah. other people. Because if they're at that high level as well, you're going to learn something and, you know, you, you know, MMA guy, you might compete against that guy once in your lifetime, you're not going to give anything away. No. Jiu-Jitsu, you're probably going to compete against them 10, 20 times in your lifetime. Yeah. Um, and usually that, like, you get all that one detail that that's something missing to sort of really solidify it. Yeah. And... It's going to be worth that travel to the open map for that one detail to really unlock yeah. a whole aspect of your game. Well, it's like, uh, you know, back to the, the B team and the Danaher thing, Craig Jones is like the perfect example of that, isn't he? Mm. Uh, competitor to all the guys at Danaher's, especially Gordon Ryan, and then eventually they're like, fuck it, he was trained together. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, now he's split again. That's it. For the story is continuing. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's gonna be. It's gonna be like a documentary in twenty years, isn't it? The truth behind the B team. I'm pretty sure Flo Brackler's <laughs> already got one coming out next year. Lies. <laughs> it's a conspiracy documentary. What uh, I heard last night as well. I don't know how true this is, and if I've got this wrong, by all means, call me out in the comments. But. Did you see the recent goings on with Machine Gun Kelly and Conor McGregor at the awards? I saw show? like a 60 second video of it on. So I kind of found it quite funny how it was like a week after Machine Gun Kelly had a new album out. <laughs> so it's like, oh, it's not orchestrated, is it? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, guess what they got lined up? What? A fight. Nah, fuck off. Apparently there's a fight lined up between Honestly, the two of them for next oh year. Oh my god. I was talking about it and they were like the Logan brothers ruining the fight game like more and more fighters taking dives and I was like if that's the case like I kind of understand it because of the levels of pain they were receiving in the UFC for one fight you're getting probably upwards of five mil take a dive and actually got extra mil maybe it's not not that bad. I mean, uh, does McGregor need the money for it? And is he, if that's the case, is he going to take it? Uh, how much profit to all is he selling? Is the real question. Well, he's got a bar now, he in Ireland. He's not punched an old man for a while, has he? Um, <laughs> maybe he just really wanted a picture with Megan Fox. She wasn't, she, that, that outfit was interesting. <laughs> you couldn't wear that to Jiu Jitsu, could you? <laughs> uh, to be fair, like, I've, I've not looked into it, so I, I didn't really see any of the details. All I saw was McGregor <laughs> being dragged away and thrown a pine pot, and then headlines um, about them, and then, yeah. Well, the other one that I thought was interesting, which is like blatantly obvious as well, that it's just a setup for a fight, is uh, Masvidal and um, whichever Logan it is. Paul, J Jake? Is it an empty fight? Like, no, Lo Jake Paul. Yeah, they, so yeah, be, but this is what's weird about it, isn't it? In the Askren fight, Masvidal was training or one of the training partners for Jake Paul. Was it? I think so. So as far as I see it from this, if, if I'm, unless I'm completely getting my facts wrong, is that Masvidal's gone like, come on, help me up here. If he's been a training partner on, he's like, you know, give me a piece of the yeah. pie on this one. Let's start stirring a bit of shit between us so we can have a fight and just put a couple of million in his pocket just from that. And I mean, why not? <laughs> like I say, I get why they're doing it. Yeah. It's just a shame that they're tarnishing their legacy within, I won't say within MMA, but within combat sports. I think it matters. Like, can you, you know, the funniest thing of all that would be that if he was legit knocking them out. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's just like, it's a fix, it's a fix. And yeah. It, imagine after, after all of it, he actually was just putting them all to sleep. <laughs> I mean, that's off to him, like... Um, yeah, it's kind of like the... It's kind of the best and the worst position to be in, isn't it? Because everybody's like, is it fake? Isn't it fake? It's fake, but, like, it's there's that debate up in the air and it just makes it a lot more interesting. Yeah. So all the fighters who get beat, you know, whether they're not going to admit to it being a fix... No. But then it's always kind of floating in the air there. That reminds me of Bob Sapp. Um, 
for like a lot of years. Just takes fights because he's a you know he's a freak show and everybody wants to see him in, in competition. But he get hit quite often and then just go on the ground, shell up and tap to strike him on the floor just to take the money. I mean, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Like he's not a fighter. When he an NFL player. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I remember I've seen him do some disgusting stuff to people, like power bombing them, and just yeah, uh, he, he's a he's an enormous man. He's like yeah. over three hundred pounds of muscle, isn't he? He's basically an experiment of what can you do with steroids. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. And Japan loves him. And Japan loves him. Well, I've seen all game shows, all that sort of stuff. He's like he's a bit got of his own uh, brand of cereal. National celebrity, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, and if you're taking that many fights to keep like ticking your income over, why would you take the damage? Yeah, it's not brainer. I don't know. It's yeah. You know, it seems over the, the last couple of years that more and more there's a blur of the lines between MMA and WWE. Uh, it's yeah. probably even more so now with the celebrity boxing stuff. Um, and at the end of the day, it's sports entertainment. Mm. It might end up going mm. that the uh, you know legit. MMA goes to more of like what jud uh, judo and those sorts of sports are now where it's just oh, like no. you're just watching the sport and then for the sports entertainment side of it there's this other thing. See because like with the actual main event fights and stuff I do enjoy watching the countdown shows, I do enjoy watching the um, do the, the video, the vlogging and stuff that they put. Um, yeah, the um, embedded. That's the one. Yeah, I do enjoy watching that stuff because it's interesting to see what they get up to in the week of the fight, how their training is going. I don't watch it for the drama. I watch it for their training. Yeah. See how hard they're training. See if there's anything that I can implement into mine. Um, <clears throat> I can do without all the nonsense. Like it was funny, the McGregor stuff until after the Aldo fight. So the Aldo fight was entertaining, but then it kind of got carried away after that. Um, so it's, I don't know, I wouldn't mind it just going back to quick-witted, bantery, good press conference stuff, and not all the social media nonsense that's coming out now. It's never the Conor McGregor's out of the box. It's never going to go back to the way it was before, no. unfortunately. I'll tell you what, though, just to get us off the topic of this, I saw an interesting thing uh, the other day um, about uh, it was a statistic comparing Aldo and his title defences against uh, Khabib. And I've seen quite a few things actually that have said, have you ever seen that meme where the guy's like on the podium getting the medal and then spraying himself with champagne? Yeah. And then he's actually like in third place or whatever. Uh, they, they put that person as Khabib and had like one title defence or whatever it was and that, or however many title defences he's had and then everybody else on the roster up to like uh, John Jones and GSP having 14, 13 title defences that people are kind of writing off his uh, st statistic legitimacy based on the fact that he only had one or two title defences or whatever it was I mean I don't think he didn't did he? It, it, was, it wasn't I don't think it was very many was it after he got the actual title because he didn't even do four or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't the number of title defences, it was also the depth of the lightweight division. Yeah. The way in which he won his fights. I'm not saying anything yeah. either way, I'm just saying it was an interesting statistic mm. when you look at like Aldo, who's completely been written off after he got knocked out by McGregor. And actually, what he did do before and up to oh, that point. He, yeah, he was an absolute savage. Like, well, yeah, I do. That's quite an interesting um, thing, though, actually. And you, you know, uh, as much as what John Jones has done outside of the outside of the sport, what you look at his record for MMA, he's he's basically fought. You, maybe you could argue that some of the guys that he's fought are on the decline, but you look at the names of the guys that he's fought. Well, he's fought through like th is it three or four generations of fighters. Everybody. Like, and that Reyes fight was questionable, wasn't it? Like, whether it was a win or a loss. Yeah. So. Yeah, he's been around for a long time. He's only young, yeah. but he's been around for a long time. And, you know, you put that many mileage on the clock, that much mileage on the clock in a sport like MMA. Yeah. Um, you're going to get caught out of some time. That's what Aldo was saying. I think, but attached to that statistic that I saw was a quote that was saying, if you hang around for long enough, um, 
and to defend their championship titles, then you're going to get caught out at some point. Mm. Nobody goes out on a high. You know, even look at GSP. Yeah, they technically did. He, you know, he got beat, and then I think it was the Johnny Hendricks fight. Um, a lot of people. Were that was set. a brilliant fight, that one. It. That was a long time ago. Back when Johnny Hendricks wow. used to throw sledgehammers, and then he retired afterwards, didn't he? Yeah. But then came back and beat Michael Bisping for the middleweight title. Like, <laughs> for me, Khabib was an amazing fighter, but I, I don't think he's amongst the Silvers, GSPs, and John Joneses of the sport. <clears throat> he probably needed a few to solidify himself a bit more before he took that retirement. Like, fair enough, 29 and 0, impressive. But maybe he took the title too late in his career. I was just thinking if he if Khabib would have been around early days and been able to do what he did earlier on, he'd be a bigger star than he is now. Mm. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And he's he's already a massive star. Oh, he's huge, yeah. And I think one way for maybe him to sort of push that legacy and try and solidify that goat discussion would be to maybe get into some sort of coaching and bring the next crop of fighters through yeah and then be like i did this my guys did this as well through my teachings well what's interesting about him as well is um like he's seen not tarnishing his legacy is maybe the wrong word, but a lot of people are throwing a lot more shit his way after he's retired on the basis of some of the stuff that he's coming out and saying in interviews. Yeah, he's like misogynistic and stuff, like saying ring girls shouldn't be a part of MMA. And then you've got Valentina Shevchenko saying like shut up, basically like ring girls are as much as uh, MMA as the commentators are and the the lights and the entrances and mm. the fans and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, he's, uh, he's a Muslim guy, isn't he? He's got like very traditional views, and I think a lot of those conflict with like obviously what the UFC is about. Yeah. And um, didn't he go on Tyson as well and basically like tell him to put his weed away <laughs> on the podcast? Yeah. Yeah. He's like. He's a very virtuous guess, guy in his own beliefs, but like, it uh, seems to be rubbing people up the wrong way. Yeah. Like, he's been more I, outspoken about him. Because I get like why he's saying what he's saying. Like, like you say, he's a very traditional sort of Muslim with strong core beliefs. But it's kind of, you can't try and push those onto others, especially in a culture where there's a lot more accepted different things. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, man. I think that is probably going to affect his... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's yeah, completely fine. It, you know, that's your belief system. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, you run with it. But I'm just, I think it's interesting how um, his legacy or the uh, the public opinion of him has been affected off the basis mm -hmm. of what he's saying in interviews post retirement. Yeah, I think the one thing that he can take away from it though is he's sticking to being himself. Like he's so. not, he's not changing under the pressure or due to his surroundings, he's staying strong, strong to himself. Now, whether that's a detriment to his media career or not, but he's still going to have a strong following amongst any community who, like, who, is, who follows his, like, who hey. has the same... Yeah, uh, and, and which is beliefs. great, like, 100% respect him for... Um, it, it, I would think it would be so much worse if, it, like, especially in today's society, if he's now started flip-flopping on his opinions that he holds strong yeah. just to try and like curry more public favour. Yeah. Like that'd be and I couldn't see him doing that at all. I don't no. you know, although he wants to build his brand and whatever, I don't think that he cares less that people don't like his opinions. No. So just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I think the big one well, that made me laugh when I did see it was when he went to Mike Tyson and like his podcast is It's called Hot Boxing with yeah. Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's 
a podcast about smoking weed and fighting, like, if you don't agree with the smoking weed, don't go on a show. Mm. Yeah. Like, as simple as that. It's like, if you don't care about DMT, you don't go on Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. <laughs> yeah. What, what a perfect place to end the show. <laughs> if you don't care about weed, don't go on Mike Tyson. If you don't care about DMT, don't go on Joe Rogan. If you care about quality grappling discussion, go on the Grapplers Academy. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe button, uh, hit that bell next to the subscribe button to make sure you get all the notifications when we drop a video. Um, a bonafide PT coached by Sai with the Grapplers Academy see you next week <laughs>